Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. We have Matt Holman with us today. Matt is with QPilot.cloud. And what we are going to be talking about is actually world-class subscription scaling. So of course, as many of you who listen to the podcast know, the point of view is about ascending your business to world-class. And one of the things that Matt and I were talking about in the pre-show is the prevalence of subscription-based business models. And so what we're really going to be talking about is how do the best in the world do what they do in a way that gives them a real competitive advantage? advantage. So anyway, before we get going too much, Matt, please introduce yourself and don't let me talk too much. Oh, absolutely. Doug, it's great to be here. And I really like that introduction. Yes. So I run marketing at qpilot.cloud and we do a lot of work with subscription brands in the e-commerce space. Yeah. And I do a lot of analysis and content creation as well in that space. So everything I'm doing is always looking at what's working and what's working yeah. really well for the best brands. Excellent. Okay. So now when we say subscription brand, help us unpack what that means a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what the most common subscription that people are familiar with is like the Amazon Primes and the yeah. Netflix of the world, right? A digital subscription, mm -hmm. getting some kind of service or good out of that. Yeah. Those have been rising in more and more prominence. And I'm sure everybody's here is tired of having 10 different streaming services. And then the other side of that, the other end of the equation is like thinking about subscription box businesses. There's been this yeah. rise over the last 10 years of you know, you're getting a soap of the month or you're getting something like mm -hmm. that. But a lot of the subscriptions that we're seeing that are still growing and increasing in value are one-time purchase companies that are also offering subscription offerings. So thinking mm -hmm. about like supplements, thinking about CBDs are increasing yeah. a lot. So you, something you might normally buy, the company wants you to buy on a repeat basis because you're using it on a repeat basis. Yeah. Exactly. Because one of the things that I would kind of think about is, you know, right in an old economy way of thinking about things, if you had, say, something like supplements or whatever, you'd have to go to a retail location to purchase those. Right. If you're talking stuff back in the day, you know, if you wanted supplements, you had to go to GNC or the Weird Natural store. Whereas, of course, now what you can do is you can get online and purchase whenever you want. You know, and where I feel like this conversation is going or what I would, you know, kind of what I've seen is that the really astute people are going to say, hey, instead of waiting for people to decide that they want to buy this, why don't we offer them an incentive to just get it delivered on a regular cadence, whether that extra product, better product, better pricing, whatever. Because the thing that a lot of people have figured out is that the cost of getting traffic that is ready to buy to your offer is actually rather large. So it's like, you know, you don't want to just let them go away. <laughs> you, know, right. you, you want to incentivize them to stay with you because finding another one isn't easy. Exactly. Yeah. So I, the brand that I love talking about too, of one that has been around for a really, really long time is Dollar Shave Club. So uh -huh. if anybody who actually ends up watching, we'll see, you know, I have a shaved head, I'm regularly using razors and I get razor replacement cartridges regularly every month. Yeah. And then periodically I'll get a new handle and every once in a while, I'll try out one of their other products that they're yeah. upselling. Yes. Well, in fact, uh, so it's funny you mentioned Dollar Shave Club. I, I bought some of their stuff a little while ago. You know, I in my memory, I keep thinking it was fairly recent. And then I went online and I found out that all the stuff I bought, they don't sell anymore. So I'm like, okay, I guess it was a <laughs> little further back than I thought. <laughs> The Dollar Shave Club is actually unique because the way that they actually scaled was essentially by, by putting, I think there's about like five or six viral videos that really drove right. a lot of their brand awareness. They were able to, they saw an opportunity to disrupt a market that was like selling yeah. these really, really expensive razor packs in a way that was, you know, not very convenient for somebody who me, who is shaving regularly, it's easier yeah. just to get that delivered to my door. And what makes their experience so great is, you know, if I say I, my hair grows out or something like that for a while, or I don't yeah. shave as much, it's so simple for me to just log in, pause, skip. Yeah my next order needs to be three months from now. And so when we're talking subscriptions, we're talking like this secret for a world-class program. You got to be thinking about it kind of like one of two ways, I think, which is yeah. Dollar Shave Club was able to disrupt. They mm -hmm. saw an opportunity there, but there isn't necessarily anything in their business model at this point that is incredibly innovative, right? They're a yeah. very, very large world-class brand. And so if we're thinking about you want to innovate the space or the way that I talk to a lot of brands that are trying to figure out growth is thinking about how you can build community or create mm -hmm. more engaging relationships with your, like you were saying, you don't, people don't want to, you don't want them to have to think too hard about coming back to buy again, or if they come to buy you, that acquisition cost is really high. How do you hold on to them? Yeah. You know, it's about product and value. Yes, that's one part of it, but there's a level of engagement that's possible for the brands that position themselves in a creative way to be more engaging 
to have yeah, more yeah. emotional attachment to that product and that purchase experience. Yeah. Well, if I can pivot the conversation a little bit, I think there's something really profound in, I think both in what you said and almost what we haven't said yet, which is that, because I think about the, the old marketing mix that we all learned at business school was, you know, price, product, pr placement, right. promotion. Right. How relevant is that anymore? I would argue not that much because the thing is that, you know, price assumes that you have people's attention. Product, again, assumes, assumes people care. <laughs> You know, placement, again, assumes you have people's attention. Same thing with promotion. I mean, basically, I think that the entire marketing mix is funneled through this little tiny keyhole, right. which is people's attention, which is harder to get than it ever has been. And so I think that's actually where the subscription continuity relationship is. I think that's the next wave. And I don't know what the next wave is after that. But I feel like the kind of the proverbial old way of doing these things is going to dry up really fast. Yeah. And so with that same thing, I think that there's the brands that are doing it really well. You, I think in subscriptions, you see two different types of products. There's a product where I don't want to have to think about. Mm -hmm. So like the Dollar Shave Club is an interesting example, Matt. Another one we're seeing in the B2B space is say you buy an air filtration unit for your house. Sure. You don't want to think about when you need replacement car air filters. So you yeah. subscribe knowing that a year from now, based on your usage, they're going to... And then the innovation in that space is there's now AI that's going to be monitoring that. Like there's machine learning involved and in when you actually need that yeah. filter based on your area and they're going to figure that out for you. So you don't have to think about, oh, it's time for me to replace the filter. They're telling you when to do that. But the other side about that is product when people actually still want some kind of engagement, mm -hmm. when there's a community where if, you know, if I'm buying something like, so like CBD is, a, is just hugely yeah. popular right now. And so I get gummies to help me sleep. Yeah. You know, my brand, if I wanted to start communicating with other people that have the same sleep issues and talk about yeah. how CBD Delta 8 is helping us sleep, that brand has an opportunity to create a community around that product yeah. and that outcome. And being best brands that do that are the ones that are finding scale because more and more people want to come into the community. And then those people end up inviting more and more people to the community as well. Yeah. So it changes your acquisition costs and your strategy uh, from yeah. top down. Yeah. Well, and because I think they, this is where even pivoting again to, I think, another really big idea, which is that I see the future of a lot of uh, product distribution being more community-based as opposed to distribution retailer-based. Prime example, I think a, a couple of weeks ago, I got to send a whole bunch of promo emails from Grant Cardone pitching a 10X energy drink. I go, right. okay, well, he almost certainly white-labeled something from Red Bull or Monster or whatever, but Grant Cardone has an enormous community of people who will eagerly listen to basically everything he says because right. they trust his message. And so I think that, you know, at least in my view, that's probably your most reliable way to be able to move product and to be able to drive growth and scale is really by engaging, a, creating and engaging a community versus just trying to push through distribution. Absolutely. So if you think about like the, in e-commerce, the trend over the last few years has been related to reviews, right? Amazon, yeah. that's how you dominate on Amazon. That's how you're successful on your own site. You need to have reviews. You need to have people in there that are talking about the product yeah. and and then there's been this motion with user generated content. You want to see a, a TikTok real post of somebody talking about their cool product and what they did. Yeah. And that's like gold marketing for the company. But community is really where it's at, where you think about if I go out looking for a solution, who am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to Dollar Shave Club with my shaving question? Or am I going to go listen to the guy who's got a YouTube channel where he vets 10 different shaving products every month? Yeah. He's got a community of people that are all listening and that I can go ask questions to. Yeah. So we're seeing this at every level from a SaaS, like selling software all the way down into consumer products. I'm going to ask the people that have already solved this problem, how they yeah. solved it and what they use. And that's yeah. where the communities really come into play. Yeah. One of the ways I've heard this described is it's almost like a web 3.0 version of, of influencers, right? You know, kind of the, the web two version was the super influencers who dominate Facebook and Instagram. This is the proverbial Tony Robbins, right? You know, who has like, you know, 10 million Facebook followers or something like that. For anybody who's not aware, the idea of web 3.0 is it's really because 
I'm just going to do quick, 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 quick back <laughs> tangent. Okay. So web 1.0 was basically where you had websites and you had things like direct purchases. Web 2.0 is basically where you get social media and where you have large amounts of traffic and interaction that are driven through social sites. You know, essentially it's where you kind of went to a centralized collaborative web. Web 3.0 is where you have a decentralized collaborative web. The idea there, crypto is supposed to be a part of web 3.0, although I have sorted opinions about that. Just my observation of the way that blockchain is set up is that it's so internally wasteful that it is dependent on continually escalating prices in order to be viable. I think, you know, unless there's an enormous price escalation, I think blockchain based crypto is going to have big problems. But that's not the point of today's conversation. But the idea of Web 3.0 is basically where you, where you make things more decentralized. And so the idea behind a micro influencer would be that say, okay, so it's like, you know, instead of saying trying to go through someone like Tony Robbins, who's basically impossible to get to, what you would do is you would find somebody who has, say, 5,000 followers who are all, you know, obsessively interested in, for example, how to shape and shave your beard. Or for example, I'm going to pick weird stuff. Say you're talking about home brewing wine or home brewing right. beer or some type of very specific niche topic. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That, if, if you speak, well, right now, like you look at the rise of like Discord servers and yeah. like black communities, Facebook groups. I mean, Facebook groups have been around for a long time, but they're still changing and growing. So the idea is that there are communities all over the place that are focusing on a common theme or element or problem solving interest, whether that's video games or a hobby yeah. or something like that. You know, Reddit again is another, like that's the majority of that community is it's segmented by different yeah. interests. So, so yeah, I think when we're talking about where scale comes from, it's it's not just like, okay, I've got a cool product or even that I've got a cool way to solve a problem. And cause uh -huh. that's when we, when we learn marketing, like the next, next level of elevating our marketing game is talking to outcomes, right? Like, you know, it's not the fact that I buy the razor because it's easy to use. It's because I like how I feel yeah. when the head is, you know, shaved. Right. And so the next iteration of that is some sense of belonging of niching down to community. Yeah. So and we're talking about world-class companies, it's not always about finding something that everybody needs. It's about dialing in on a customer and a community and a problem or a sense or a feeling that people can identify with, I think is where the power really is in being able to market those products. Yes, I think very, very much so. Particularly because it's like the deeper, more specifically you can niche down. I don't know if I'm going to say easier, but it gets to where it's like you can build and access those communities without having to do as much broad-based marketing. Because of course, the problem with like broad-based marketing or broad-based fulfillment or whatever is that there's a lot of costs associated with it and you will spend a lot of effort, money, whatever to get things in front of people who are never going to buy. And so then what ends up happening is you end up trying to float a lower overall conversion rate, which means that you either need to increase your prices or you need to have ridiculous amounts of scale. And of course, the problem is when you have very large amounts of scale, then you end up creating a sprawling organization with internal politics that will inevitably make it difficult to grow. I think the big advantage of a niche-based company is that you can stay small enough basically to where you can grow, expand, and scale without having internal management you know, or without having as much internal management politics creep in. Just because my observation is that's probably the biggest impediment to a lot of companies is that once you get past a certain point, you end up having a lot of people in positions of authority who are just as, if not more concerned about their position within the pyramid than they are about advancing the company mission forward. Yeah, definitely. And I think that I do like how this conversation has gone where we're talking more about communities and things. I think we have to understand that when you find the right people and you have a message that resonates with them, they will yeah. talk about you outside of those communities. Yes. So if we find a discord server, that's all about home brewing, you know, your own beer, yeah. right? Like, and you find that group and you start selling them hops because that's uh -huh. your commerce business, right? Those people start talking about your product outside of that. Yes. They're going to go to trade shows. They're going to be all over farmers markets and places like that. And we'll be talking about you because they're passionate about what you're yeah. doing and what, how you've been engaging with them in the community. And I think when we're finding additional ways to grow or scale, it comes down to when we understand whose attention we actually have, we can figure out what other pain points that are in there that can actually fit in with our business yeah. model. So we could start selling casks, right? We could start selling fermenting equipment as well instead yeah. of just, just hops to those same types of people.
Yes, correct. And then I was just thinking, then it's like you get somebody who's really good. That's where you say, okay, well, have you, you know, business coaching, marketing support, the rabbit hole keeps going. <laughs> it really does. Oh, I've now developed a software you can use to manage yeah, your, yeah. like the different casts. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. exactly. All right. Well, hey, Matt, this has been a lot of fun. Let's see. So since we're getting close to time, but but always want to make sure to deliver a little extra value. Uh, give us one or two last thoughts and then make sure to share your website and let us know which socials we can find you on. Absolutely. I'll lead by saying, you know, follow me on LinkedIn, Matthew Holman, yeah. QPilot. I'm also on Twitter and I do have a weekly newsletter related to subscriptions called the subscription prescription. So I drop weekly tips, things you should be testing, ways to approach the subscription business. But I, I do think that Honestly, when other people ask me for that little nugget, it's actually been a lot of what we've been talking about is mm -hmm. if you can understand why people are buying from you, you yeah. can make it clear to them why they should keep buying from you. And so whether that's direct outreach, phone calls, pop-up surveys and emails are good, but they're, you don't always get as much traction of those, but pick up the phone and call your customers and find yeah. out what made you want to buy this? What was motivating for you? Because when you start to unlock that part of the puzzle, then it's easy to find other groups and other people that have that same type of problem or motivation for wanting to buy your product. Got it. All right. Well, hey, Matt, just really appreciate your time. It's been great, Doug. Thank you. All right. Thanks.